Fantastic. Well, at first, I want to thank uh, thank the organizers and uh, it, for stretching to deliver this uh, this interesting day of talks in in a digital format. So, um, really enjoying the work so far, and looking forward to talks through the rest of the day. And so, I'm coming to you today from uh, the Groton from Groton, Connecticut, at Pfizer's uh, uh, main research site uh, for uh, in uh, and specifically coming to you from the pharmacology group today where our, we uh, deliver primary potency data to project teams, uh, the data that the medicinal chemists use uh, to understand if the uh, adjustments they're making to their molecules as uh, they take them from discovery and through develop, development to a clinical candidate. Uh, they, we deliver the data that they use to decide whether or not the biology, the potency and effect on the biology is getting stronger or weaker. You know, and and uh, so that's the, the context of the group that I'm coming from today. And so I'd like to talk to you about uh, improving preclinical translation using a case study of our uh, physiologically relevant rule of three. So um, I understand that this group is well versed in the uh, challenge of drug discovery and taking a basic research idea uh, from inception all the way through to FDA approval to a, uh, to a drug. I say that there are two main stumbling points here. Uh, the first is in uh, preclinical triage, where we can't elicit an efficacy in a model that we believe is predictive to the disease in humans, and uh, that's that's where most uh, research projects die. Then, but for the one third that do transfer in and and are advanced into clinical studies, uh, they're remarkable. There's a remarkable failure rate at phase two. And what's phase two is, is efficacy in modulating the disease phenotype in, in, in humans. And so when we look at uh, you know, retrospectively at data that's now over a decade old, but I think uh, still represents the challenge quite well, is that 18% you know, of phase two clinical trials were successful uh, in a pan uh, pharma study. So, uh, and when we look at what is, why do those, why do those projects fail? that by and large, a little over half of them fail because of efficacy. So this is, represents a poor translation of the, uh, the poor power of our preclinical models to predict the human disease. That it needs considerable improvement. So this is all the way from our in vitro models that we use to optimize compounds for preclinical testing, in preclinical testing, all the way through to our animal models. And so uh, the, 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 our animal models may not be predicting the human disease as well as they need to in order to get the, to test the hypothesis about the target and also uh, develop and deliver compounds that are ready for, and truly modulate the, the disease in humans. So uh, say Pfizer and rule-based guidance, you're all familiar with the Lipinski rule of three. That is a, a set of parameters that if you design molecules within, will uh, provide you compounds that have a, a good probability of being soluble and uh, per permeable to cell membranes, which in turn translates into compounds that have a high bioavailability and probability of, of being advanced in a, as, a, as drug-like molecules. You heard from our chemical biology, may have heard from our chemical biology group about the four pillars of target validation, which include uh, exposure at the site of action, target demonstrating target engagement, some pharmacal, functional pharmacology output, and uh, to show that the, the action that you're expecting in the cell is happening because you're engaging the target, and the ability to, uh, to elicit the relevant disease phenotype or, or cure the disease phenotype. So that, that's their, their core pillars of target validation. Today I'm gonna to discuss with you uh, reference below from our uh, department here in Groton, the, uh, uh, physiologically relevant rule of three uh, and de designing the idea here being that uh, if you uh, follow these three rules, you will arrive at assays that are more predictive of the human disease biology and the disease biology you're interested in. Studying and modulating to deliver clinical candidates that will, may work. Uh, so this rule of three involves, uh, em embraces uh, three main uh, choices that are made in uh, the early clinical uh, or early project stage in designing the assays that are gonna report the biology that the compounds are 
are identified with in high throughput screening or other discovery platforms, and the potencies that are used to optimize them into uh, candidates for later stage and advanced biological testing. And so these rule of three include uh, assessing the disease relevance of the uh, system that you're studying the, the, the potent the compounds in on, and the cell type. And so we see a, a diagram here of, uh, of a representative uh, system of biology in, the cell, in a cell, native cell's response to a stimulus where the stimulus activates it and the signal is transduced through a series of nodes to elicit a functional phenotype. Now, uh, conversely, in, in some cell lines, the, the expression of proteins can be different. And these pathways may be, uh, part, parts of these pathways may be upregulated or downregulated. And so while uh, you may see the same pathway exist within the cell, the main pathway that leads to the phenotype that that cell is eliciting could arise from alternate stimulation or lack uh, other parts of the pathway that modulate uh, transfer through the, uh, of the of the signal within the cell. So, uh, so it, to us, in, in in selecting the native cells and or selecting the appropriate cell is of critical importance. And we, uh, in all aspects, prefer to work with native human cells as much as possible. Uh, be those primary isolates from patients or donors or from IPSC derived cell lines, but we, we find this to be really important to be sure that we have, we're studying cells that have the correct pathway uh, within them. And so the second important is to choose a disease relevant stimulus. You can imagine this, uh, you know, my favorite example here is comparing, uh, is the wound healing uh, assay for, or the assay for wound healing called the scratch assay. And, and really to ask the question, how, how relevant is, is the stimulation you're giving to the cells to the disease phenotype that you're looking for? And so I would argue that gouging a cell, a monolayer of cells with a pipette tip and looking to see how fast the cells retreat and, and or fill that, that, that uh, scratch in the, the monolayer back in is, is not really representative of what's going on in the, in the human uh, biology and wound healing. And so that's an example of a poor stimulus. Um, and so, uh, and the third one is readout to the proximal proximity of the readout to either the clinical endpoint or the, uh, or the, or what you're studying with the assay that you're designing. And so, uh, and a, an observation that we've made is that if you do hit finding in the same assay, studying the same pathway with native cells over here on the left, and do hit finding in a, in a similar assay built in a cell line, you will, each one of those assays will define hits. And there will be a portion of hits that are picked up by both of those assays. But if you were to choose to work in cell lines, you're going to pick up compounds that aren't active in the native cell lines and also miss the compounds that are active in the native cells that are not picked up by the cell line because the, the pathway and the, the tone in the system is different from the natural biology and the disease biology we're looking to study. So I'd like to uh, walk you through a case study of this uh, with, uh, that we applied to TBK1 kinase to give you an idea of the decisions and uh, work that we do in this area to build assays that we believe are predictive of, of the, the clinical biology that we're looking to study and interrupt uh, to improve uh, uh, the clinical outcome in patients. And so uh, TBK1 is a kinase in the cent that plays a central role in the cytoclake, uh, cytosolic nucleic acid sensing pathway of uh, innate immunity. And, and topical, as we've uh, seen multiple talks about viral viruses uh, and, and COVID and its role in, in, and the role of the immune system in, in picking it up and causing further uh, damage and, and uh, negatively impacting clinical outcomes of, of uh, the disease. And so uh, this system is part of your body, the pattern, pattern recognition elements, and rec contains a series of proteins that recognize cytosolic double-stranded RNA that would arise from uh, in the classical setting and from viruses or from single-stranded or double-stranded RNA uh, that is within the cytosol and, and shouldn't be there in the first place because it should be in the nucleus. So we have a series of sensors that pick these up and uh, specifically in our, our interest, we were concerned in looking at the role of the uh, cytosolic DNA, double-stranded DNA sensing pathway 
within the immune system as uh, to study uh, interferonopathies and in, uh, autoimmune diseases. And so this pathway constitutes uh, a C-gas enzyme that pick, senses the double-stranded DNA and creates the cyclic guanine adenine mononucleotide. So this is a cyclic dinucleotide secondary messenger that binds to sting, operates, uh, phosphorylates TBK1, and elicits eventually interferonopathies uh, through the secretion of interferon beta, and which through autocrin signaling leads to uh, interferon response genes uh, being secreted. And so the classical way to look at this would be to uh, maybe stimulate the cells upstream and watch for cytokine secretion at the, uh, down at the end of the day. And so uh, again, it said that this was CGAMP is a secondary messenger and there's this transcription factor in the middle. So there's a lot of biology in this pathway. And our program uh, had a specific interest in studying TBK1. We were uh, assessing the, the value of TBK1 inhibitors. And so wanting to remove all this complex biology from our assay, we chose to try to find an endpoint as far upstream and close to TBK1 and the stimulation procedure as far downstream as possible that we could use to study the, the, bio, the, the keynotes and biology here and have a, a readout that's proximal to the, the target that we're modulating in our assay to be sure we aren't picking up polypharmacology and uh, misleading our chemistry team. So looking at the applying this to TBK1, we look at autoimmune diseases and uh, the, the hypothesis for how this would be involved and, and where this, this pathway would be activated. Primarily that would be in macrophages and uh, monocytes that cruise around and pick up the junk around the body. And uh, the idea being here being that these macrophages are out picking up uh, inflamed in, in inflamed tissue, gobbling up the junk. They're picking up double-stranded DNA. Somehow that's making its way into the cytosol of the macrophage and then igniting this pathway and causing further, auto, further uh, inflammation. And so we were looking specifically, wanted to get this assay into uh, macrophages, M1 macrophages. And looking at the ways that we could stimulate the pathway, uh, three ways that you can get a readout of, the, of TDK1 are to use poly-IC, uh, which activates the double-stranded RNA sensing. You could use double-stranded DNA or CGAMP. And so we chose to get as close as possible uh, and to look at using this uh, cyclic dinucleotide secondary messenger as our stimulus. And uh, looking at proximity and readout to the clinical endpoint, we wanted to use a phosphoprotein readout uh, looking at phosphoirf 3 directly. So this would allow us to stimulate directly upstream uh, and through two uh, phosphorylation events, arrive at the, the phosphoprotein that we're reading out. And in the beginning, there was a Western blot. This uh, comes from my colleagues uh, in the uh, Vic Rao in the research unit. And so he had recapitulated some results shown in the data or in the literature that showed that you could elicit uh, interferon uh, responses out of cells by treating them directly with CGAMP. You'll appreciate this is a phosphorylated uh, cyclic dinucleotide, so in general, not permeable to cells. So, uh, but he produced this Western blot with a, uh, in THP1 cells, so a, a, a monocyte, a monocytic uh, cell line, showed that we could observe increase in phosphoirf 3 over time uh, under these treatment conditions. And so uh, we developed a strategy to build out the assay that we wanted, and I, I show this to you here. So you can appreciate that while we want an assay in macrophages at the end of the day, that we started out and worked in THP1s because macrophages are, are a challenge to make and expensive to produce. And so the, our strategy here was to build the assay in THP1s, deploy it early to the project team, while we uh, identified the macrophages and the production mechanism we wanted to use for that, and then evaluate them uh, from different donors, scale them up, uh, bridge the two uh, results from the two experiments into an assay that our, uh, would, we would hold in production for the project. Um, and so uh, important to this, I showed you that Western blot from Vic, but what we wanted to see from uh, stimulation was uh, to see a pharmacological response that's saturable. And so with our kit, we have initially assessed that this works with phosphatase inhibitors. It's a classic way to study uh, kinase, to st stimulate cells that, uh, in an assay for a kinase. 
And just by uh, jamming up the equilibrium that would normally exist by dephosphorylation of the, of the proteins. And so we assessed our, uh, the, the maximum capacity of the kit system we were using from SysBio, found that we could achieve a fourfold window. And, uh, and at this cell density, we weren't pinning the kit. And so I won't belabor the, uh, all the work that went into developing the CGAMP stimulation procedure, uh, except to say that we found uh, that it took an incredible amount of CGAMP in order to get saturation at, uh, at 100,000 cells per well and uh, employed a lipofectamine uh, reagent to increase the permeability of this secondary messenger to the, to the cells. You can see here down at the end of the day, uh, what we arrived at in the finalized protocol with THP1s was a nice uh, saturation of the stimulation and a, a beautiful assay window that uh, any screener would be very proud of here with, the, with high quality Z primes. When we took this over to macrophages, we uh, found that it took an incredible amount of macrophages in order to get a similar response, a usable assay window. Um, in effect, we needed 100,000 macrophages per well uh, in order to have a signal window that we felt we could pr produce high quality pharmacology data with. And we take that and back calculate what is the cost of running an assay in macrophages like this. So we're in, inside the plate, we're putting about $1,500 worth of CGAMP. $1,500 plus, plus, plus of macrophages. I say plus, 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 because that's just the cost of the raw materials to produce the macrophages for monocytes. And so you can appreciate mono, uh, monocytes from a donor. Uh, and then they have to be uh, isolated from PDMCs and then uh, advanced into, and differentiated into macrophages. It takes a lot of time. And so 100,000 macrophages per well is really an incredible amount of, uh, of cells. And then putting an additional cost on top of that of HTRF. And while I uh, appreciate that even for, for a big pharma, uh, uh, an assay running at uh, $3,500 to $4,000 a plate is not something we can move into production and, and drive the assay with, uh, drive the program with. So, uh, so what do we know about this? We, we went back to the drawing board and said, okay, well, how can we do this? We've got the biology right, and how do we do this better and cheaper? And so uh, we'll notice and acknowledge that IRF3 is a transcription factor. And so what we know about that is that upon phosphorylation by TBK1, it should try, uh, translocate from the cytosol into the nucleus uh, after that phosphorylation event. And so we asked uh, very simply, can we see this with a microscope with an automated high content imager? And, and so here we see uh, two uh, representative uh, panels of cells uh, images from cells stained with DAPI uh, or HOST, uh, looking at either vehicle or with the CGAMP, and we see nuclear beautiful nuclear localization of the of the cell of the uh, phosphor F3 in the cells that are stimulated, and um, that it overlays nicely with the nucleus there. And so this told us that we could get away with using a uh, an imaging assay in place of the HTRF uh, experiments. And so what this did was allow us to cut the cell uh, reagent cut down by tenfold um, and go through a very standard um, procedure using a high content imager to, to provide an assay that has a signal, uh, signal window of about fivefold over the vehicle. So we went through, um, and the point I wanna make with this slide is to say we advanced this assay forward and to make a point about the physiological relevance and how important it is to have that biology right. You can see here uh, an image for the cells that were stimulated with CGAMP, where there's a nice punctate nucleus uh, that represents the phosphor IRF3 signal. And then we look at cells that are stimulated with okadaic acid or Kali QNA. Now, these are the phosphatase inhibitors that I described to you on the first uh, couple of slides about this project, where the, uh, that these are uh, routine workhorses for, for cell-based cell kinase assays when you don't have a way to turn on a pathway. So um, say that if I'm gonna put my bets on the biology that is going on in the well, the, we see with these phosphatase inhibitors in order to elicit a response here, that we're getting uh, gross apoptotic-like and pro-apoptotic phenotypes of cells blooding and uh, changing shape. Uh, many of them don't have their nucleus anymore. Uh, so the just diffuse uh, cytostolic presence of phosphor F3. So not the biology that we're looking for uh, and, and hoping to study and improve our translation of the compounds that we develop into the clinic. 
And so the, the finalized procedure that we developed was a 384 well plate imaging assay um, running at, at six plates per week and 2,000 macrophages per well. So we were able to really drive the cost down and, and, and eliminate the, the burden on, on both cost and cell provision to, uh, to drive this assay forward and, and uh, uh, move the project for the team. So um, I wanna make a point here about uh, also in the uh, earlier description of THP1s versus macrophages. So how well does the pharmacology line up? Because we had built the assay up in both cell types. We explored this and tested a panel of compounds in both cells. And so what we see on this graph is the PIC50 for THP1s on the y-axis, uh, PIC50 for macrophages on the x-axis. And the gray boxes represent a tenfold deviation in, uh, in pharmacological potency. So uh, we see by and large that compounds are within tenfold uh, each direction. Uh, from the unity line. And so uh, all in all, not too bad. Uh, I'd still be concerned about driving uh, the differences here since it is at overall uh, could be a hundred fold difference across the two. But what, what's not well represented on the graph are two compounds that return micromolar IC50s and macrophages that were completely inactive in THP1s. And so as, as I, uh, as the the, in the diagram I showed you earlier with the Venn, uh, the, the Venn diagram that you can miss compounds and cell lines is a, a clear example of those compounds, of, of that diagram and that result. And so why do we think this, how do we think this could be happening? Um, we know that there are an incredible number of drug transporters expressed on human macrophages that could be absent from the THP1s. Understand that that is a uh, relative conjecture because we didn't drive down into truly understanding the cause of this discrepancy, but it, it's one possible explanation for what's going on here. Alternatively, these compounds could be effluxed from uh, THP1s and uh, would, would be another explanation that the, the compounds either not getting in the cell or uh, being rapidly effluxed. So, uh, so take home messages from this talk I, that I uh, hope uh, you can uh, uh, take with you afterwards is that the uh, physiological stimulus uh, creates an assay uh, in, in this instance that faithfully reproduces the biology of the pathway that we're studying. So here we an example here in the nuclear localization of phosphor F3, that using macrophages uh, captured different pharmacolo pharmacological profiles versus THB1s, um, including compounds that were inactive. So these are compounds we would have missed if we had or deprioritized with chemistry had we run this cell assay in THB1s. And so we believe this approach um, improves our translatability to patients and will better guide MedChem optimization uh, to the best candidate uh, for clinical testing. So I'd like to acknowledge the teams and the TBK1 project team and the pharmacologic, pharmacology group leadership. Happy to take any questions that you all have about uh, this work. Yeah, hi, Tim. Hello. Hi, I, this is Sue Swally. I had some questions. A great talk. Thank you so yes. much. Um, one was just a practical question. At mm -hmm. What's the size of your library that you were able to screen? At six plates per week, how long did it take for the whole screen to run? Okay, and so this was a focus library set uh, that what, what was coming into the assay were compounds that were pre-qualified in a TBK1 biochemical assay. And so okay. we were- Okay, so this yeah. wasn't like a primary phenotypic screen. No. <laughs> it was a, it was a follow-up. Okay, and mm -hmm. then and then that kind of comes to my, my bigger question is, you know, you have a great point about disease relevant cell types and how you were able to change your assay readout to reduce the cost, but obviously that's not always possible. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's this balance between being able to run in a more relevant cell system and doing it at all sometimes, right? And sometimes mm -hmm. people will say like, if you, if, like if you're trying to get for us into neurons mm -hmm. or into motor neurons or into something that's very complex, um, we have to use something that's slightly artificial and then validate. And obviously we're gonna, as you saw, be missing some of those true positives that you might get. Mm -hmm. But how do you balance that equation um, on a yeah, day-to-day -day so, basis? So you, gotta, you gotta, you know, in the, in the instance that you can't uh, find a creative solution to accessing the cells that you need, um, say it would by and large look to the omics database, omics result to, to direct you with the cells that are most predictive of the, the, of the cell type you're interested in. So you could imagine there are lots of different types of T cells. Uh, and so that you could apply uh, 
RNA-seq experiments and, and to look at relative gene expression between the different uh, T cell types, T cell lines, and the T cells that you that, that are uh, the type that you're interested in studying. So we look a lot to omics data to tell us, uh, characterize the what's available versus what we want, and then uh, prioritize the, the in vitro models that, that best recapitulate uh, and best match the, the biology that we're looking for. Cool, thanks. Okay. Uh, thanks, Tim. Very, uh, very uh, beautiful talk, and uh, it is uh, very much talks to the approach that we are taking at Accelerate Primary Cells. I have a question mm -hmm. regarding macrophages. Um, uh, mm -hmm. When you were doing your screening, um, I maybe missed the point. Why you wouldn't use downstream cytokines? It is much easier. You need much less supernatum to screen on mm -hmm. that. That way, it would be faster. First, let's say, first big screen doing cytokines, secreted cytokines, since you are targeting uh, mm -hmm. you know, pathways that uh, will release some of the inflammatory endpoints. Yeah, and so if you look at those, I mean, while well, we draw a, a very simple arrow and say, yeah. all of this leads to the secretion of interferon yeah. that then leads to the you know, interferon signature genes. And so there are a lot of other kinases and biological processes that are involved there that could be interrupted or picked up, they could pick up polypharmacology which would mislead us, you know, from a, mislead us from, or dis, diverge the cell-based result from the TBK1 modulation. And so we were critically focused on understanding that the compounds we were working with and nominating were, and uh, with, a, with our routine screening assay, were true TBK1 modulators, and that we weren't picking up something further downstream. You could imagine that as we were, it would advance in a lack of a better way to put it, a chain of translation from, uh, from biochemical assay up front through a cell-based assay, and we'll, we'll add biological complexity downstream, maybe in a whole blood assay, where we would look at interferon or, or, or cytokine secretion at the end of the day, but wanting to stay uh, razor focused on, on establishing that change, chain of translation and modulation of, TB, uh, of TBK1 inside the cells. Uh, would you consider then screening at least with cytokines and then following up uh, for different targets uh, and then following up with the more precise and more accurate looking on the uh, specific hits afterwards? Would you consider that approach to be cheaper, faster, easier? Oh, certainly. Yeah, you could uh, if you if you were fewer. Yeah, you, you that that it's a uh, it's. It's pure pragmatism that you need to balance yes. what's, what's the right cost in order to operate the screen to get to the molecules you're looking for. So we, in this, in this instance, in the, this, in the discovery funnel that we had uh, bumped a, a biochemical cell based or biochemical assay up front so that we would use that to pre-score uh, probable activity in this experiment. So, uh, you know, either one of those. <clears throat> I mean, I have a question for you, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, having worked in drug discovery at Pfizer myself in a way, so a lot of the drugs ultimately don't make it through development because essentially you have unforeseen cross pathway activity. So while you have essentially disease relevant pathways, how do you mm -hmm. essentially assess the cross pathway interactions which ultimately give you the roadblocks because you cannot predict essentially how the re cross pathway reactivity affects mm -hmm. your the ice toleration. How do you take care of that in your screening paradigm? Um, well, I mean, in the screening paradigm, we're focused on, you know, effectively designing chemical tools to ask, uh, to establish the, the value in the target. And so we're looking in, initially in the project to, to build up our, our uh, weight of evidence that this, the target we're working on and the pathway we're studying is going to pay off in the clinic. And so we would be asking those types of questions um, not long after we found molecules that we felt had the credentials to uh, to, to give us a valuable assessment of the of, of the pathway and the target. And so, you know, we 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 work hard to select our targets up front, but we can't be perfect in that decision. And so we we um, pull the corporate speak, uh, you know, take make bold moves to assess that biology up front with a, a you know, try, try to be as, um, as open and honest as possible about what, what we're trying to achieve at the end of the day. And once we have a compound that we believe has the credentials to make that assessment, to make that assessment early. And so, you know, fail hard, fail fast. And, 
uh, before we invest to take to build this molecule and advance it into the clinic to find that out later. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you.